Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, lovely to see so many of you in person, and I gather uh, there are quite a few people out there in ESA, so you're all very welcome. Um, and I'd like to kick off by thanking the, the home team for the absolutely seamless move that was made from in-person to online all those months ago. Uh, and now we're hybrid, is that what, mixed mode? We're, we're hybrid, apparently, it's the latest thing. It's not a car, it's the way we're doing this. So uh, I'm glad some of you came on uh, in person, and I hope there'll be more and more, because part of this is the fun of meeting people uh, and um, having a bit of a nutter outside the, the talks themselves. However, uh, we're really here to, John asked me to say, but I don't think I'm going to, uh, that it's all, we're just practicing, this is a bit experimental, so if anything goes wrong, bear with us. But if it doesn't go wrong, then I will have apologised in vain. So I'm just going to not say anything. The, uh, our first speaker, many of you will know uh, that we have been running, continuing to run the um, graduate student competition, and we have a series of winners who, uh, according to our normal custom, will come and give a little talk before the main speech. Uh, this evening we have Leah, as in Star Wars, she tells me. Well, I said, is it like Star Wars? And she said, yes, looking at me a bit witheringly. Um, but it's Leah Wenger, who's been doing work on the cells in the brain and how they respond to different contexts. Now, I heard some very complicated words, um, and so I think the best thing to do is if we listen to you, Leah, if that's all right. Well, hi everyone and thank you for having me here. I'll try and make the complicated words a bit less complicated. Are we meant to be on presenter viewing this mode or? Kind of takes away the excitement, you know, of what's she gonna go for next? That works, cool. Um, Right, so yeah, lots of complicated words, um, which basically means I try and look at different cells and make sense of what they do in the brain. Um, and to do that, I, look, I use human stem cell brain models um, to look at cell type diversity in the context of neurodegeneration. Um, this is one of the uh, mini brain samples we use, um, probably one of the only ones that's really pretty colors, so I kind of tend to reuse that a lot. But, um, <laughs> The main cell types I tended to look at in my PhD are all called glial cells, um, and in particular astrocytes. Again, first two complicated words. Um, but what do they do? Um, they're basically a bit like parents to the nerve cells, which are the ones that actually do all the signaling in the brain, in that they are there to support the nerve cells, they give them food, they tell them what connections to make, what friends not to make, um, how to fix, um, they patch them up when they're injured. Uh, and in the most part, they're very, very useful and very vital to the survival of the brain cells. Um, but they can also go wrong. Um, they can lose their pro proper supportive function or they can actually gain toxic function. And in both those cases, you get a lot of neurodegeneration and the neurons or the nerve cells themselves start to die off. And that's what we can see a lot in a lot of neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, Huntington's. Um, and we know that we know a lot about the difference, the diversity in the nerve cells themselves, because they've been studied for quite a while. But we actually don't know a huge amount about how these different astrocytes, if they are different or if they effectively are a bundle of cells that have the same function. Uh, there's some evidence in mice that shows that there are different types that are, can be better or worse at supporting the neurons. And so that's really what I wanted to explore um, in my PhD. Um, the issue is astrocytes um, are quite different between human and mice. And th in these experiments, you can see that there's a very big difference in the size and the complexity of these cells. So these are all individual astrocytes. They look very stellate. Um, and so because they are, look so different and act so different, it's pretty hard to really make any conclusions about human uh, cells looking, using mice models. So what we do in my lab instead is use human cerebral organoids, or in easier terms, in, fact, in effect, mini brains, where we take stem cells from, derived from humans, 
And then we grow them up into little clumps, and then the little clumps eventually become little brains that we slice up and we culture for an extended period of time. Uh, they have the advantage of being human, which is good. That's what we want. Um, they have a complex 3D environment, and they tend to develop as a normal fetal brain would. So they're quite useful in studying the diversity you can get in a human brain. Uh, they do have some drawbacks in that diversity also means there's added variability in them. Not all cell types are present, and you're mainly looking at one brain region, but those we were going to go with that for now. So I use those mini brains to look at cell types and especially astrocytes and what different types of astrocytes are there. But how do we look at individual cells and see, well, this cell is different to this cell? Um, so to do that, um, every cell or every cell will have in a human a similar genetic background to start with. We, we all derive from one cell, so we have the same DNA in all our cells, but they'll be expressing different genes within that cell. So your hair cells are going to express keratin-producing genes, whereas your heart cells are going to express contractile genes to help create all smooth muscle to contract the heart. So despite having the same DNA, different genes are chosen to be expressed by different cells. And if we use um, a technique called single cell RNA sequencing, uh, we can look at every individual cell and say, well, what genes are they expressing? So that's what we do here. We take um, a starting uh, little mini brain. We put it through a really expensive machine that looks more like a toy to me than anything else. Um, and then you end up with a single cell suspension, so lots of individual cells floating together. Um, and then they can be separated out to look at what types of genes every cell is expressing. And then you end up with a ton and ton of data with thousands of cells and thousands of genes. And eventually, by looking at reducing the dimensions of the data itself, you can try and identify cell types and how they separate um, in space. So this is a dimensionally reduced plot, which basically shows you every dot here is a cell. Uh, and cells that are closer together on the map should be more similar um, as a cell type. So at the bottom right, you can see that they've been labeled for different colors. Um, right on the right, we have all the nerve cells. So we have different layers of nerve cells within the brains. Uh, and then on the left are the astrocytes um, in this area here, which are the cell types that we're particularly interested in. And what we basically found was that there seems to be two main different subtypes of these astrocytes um, that we weren't really aware of beforehand. And they're marked by different types of genes um, that are expressed. And you don't need to worry all about what those genes do. But in effect, these two to three different astrocyte populations might have different functions in disease. And to verify that, uh, I looked at if they project differently onto disease data sets. Um, so again, this representation, in this representation, I've projected this data onto published Alzheimer's disease and Huntington's disease data sets uh, to see if different cells map more to the disease or more to the control. Uh, and what we basically see is that the second population, which is the lower one here, is more present in the Huntington's and the Alzheimer's disease data sets compared to the control. So that puts us thinking that maybe they are more involved in the disease. Um, and what I'm currently trying to do is, if it is, once we've separated all the cells, actually separate them fully and see if functionally they have different um, outcomes for the support of the nerve cells. So this is another fancy technique called fluorescence um, associated cell sorting. Um, but basically, I look at the markers of these cells, so they're expressing different genes. We use that to separate them out and say, well, this cell is expressing this gene, we'll pull it down. Um, and once we separate the two cells based on these genes, we can then look at their different functions in a dish. So I'm looking at whether they're better or worse at um, engulfing synapses. So that's something that in neurodegeneration will happen quite a bit, um, where you'll have unhealthy synapses would need to be engulfed and synapses will need to be um, recycled to make new healthy connections. So we can look at how they engulf things, and the more red comes up on the screen, the more they're actually eating the little synapses up. Um, 
you end up getting very excited in the lab for very little. Uh, <laughs> so this is pretty exciting for me. <laughs> um, we look at calcium imaging. Um, again, if they have different patterns of waves of signaling, so you can, you'll see that the different cells will light up in a different pattern. And those are all going to tell us things about their functions. Um, I'm looking at different reactivity markers as well, so markers that are known to be involved in um, disease or like in stressed out cells. Uh, so one of the populations has a higher load, and that's the population that's been associated with the disease. Uh, and I'm also looking at generally the morphology changes or how good they are at creating synapses. So if you take the media from the cells themselves, can you plate them onto different nerve cells and will they produce more synapses or fewer synapses? Uh, so, so far, I have, um, it seems like there is definitely a big difference in how the two populations seem to functionally uh, help or hinder the neurons um, and engulf all the different synapses. Um, and I'll hopefully soon be able to give you a proper N-controlled experiment with significant figures. Not quite there yet. Uh, the implications of this... Oh, we're going to go through the videos again, apparently. Uh, so why the hell have I been rambling on about this for... So hopefully not too long, but <laughs> enough of your time, is because there's two main implications, is that if we do find these different cell types have different functions in disease, then maybe we might be able to boost one of the two populations pharmacologically and try and get them to be preferentially involved in the processes. Um, and also, more and more of these papers are kind of coming out where we're transplanting a load of, of these progenitor cells, of these cells, into not only mice, but also humans. So in Parkinson's disease, there have been trials where they've injected a, lot of, a load of astrocytes in the brain to try and replenish it. Um, and if there is this cell type diversity, we might want to preferentially transplant a certain type of the cells over the other if one of them's hindering and one of them's helping the process. Um, so that's the current plan of EFFECT. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank my lab for everything they're doing and our collaborators and funding bodies. And thank you to all of you here and for your attention and happy to have any questions. Hello, people at home. Apparently, you couldn't hear me. I'm sure you've missed that. Um, anyway, well done, Leah. That was a fabulous talk and very reassuring for those of us of a certain age. Um, questions, please. I'll be around with my... I do have a question. Am I allowed to ask my question? Um, Depends on the question. Oh, yes, <laughs> I'd better ask my question using a microphone, uh, even though I'm standing right next to you. Um, is it, what significance is there in the huge difference in the structure of the astrocytes from, from mice to, um, to humans? Because we're both mammals, you might think they'd be the same. Yeah, it's a really good question, actually, because the neurons themselves aren't as different. So the nerve cells aren't as different as the astrocytes with mouse to human. Um, there is some difference, I mean, in the brain size and, and complexity, but we don't really understand why they're so different. Um, there have been some kind of crazy experiments where they've implanted human astrocytes into mouse brains and improved, or effectively made them cleverer. So they've improved oh. memory tasks and um, cognitive ability. Uh, so functionally, they are different. Um, they express a lot of different genes, but why? Uh, I don't think we really know that. There's a theory where, whereby there's this alternative progenitor population that's not present in mice, but is mainly present in primates, humans, and ferrets. Um, and astrocytes might come from that population more in us, um, and that might explain some of the differences. Great, thank you. Um, you said at the beginning that you grew many brain cells from stem cells. Um, from what very little I know, it's hard to do that well. I mean, are you confident that the many brain cells you grew are the same 
you know, important ways as the actual human ones? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, the same is quite a difficult thing that not many people agree on. How do you quantify the same? Um, we've had quite a lot of success with it. Our lab's been doing it for quite a while. And by, when we look at the data, in effect, we have all the cell types that we would expect. They arise in the same um, period. So normally there's a pattern to what, how the cells arise in the brain, and that pattern's conserved. Um, they seem to map quite well onto um, fetal data sets as well. Uh, now, obviously, they are still in vitro, so we don't have the certain of the cells that we're lacking, and there will always be some level of difference. But yeah, I was quite surprised how similar they did turn out to be, luckily for my PhD, because I think <laughs> the outcome would have been a bit different otherwise. <laughs> Great, thank you. And, and one more, just to prove that this really works. George Perendier, good evening, George, asks, I think this may be slightly tongue-in-cheek, but is also rather serious. Um, who are the humans who do donate to have their brain cells removed? Right, yeah. Um, as much as uh, removing brain cells would probably be the quickest way of answering the question, we sadly can't do that um, ethically. <laughs> um, actually, you can do that from, you can get, samples from epileptic patients when they have removal procedures but we use embryonic stem cells so they're immortal so they're stem cells that have been derived from an aborted fetus about the, the line we use I think was about 50 years ago and they just kept the cultures just kept going so we can indefinitely keep this stem cell line this embryonic stem cell line uh, so I guess a, do what, a fetus 50 years ago is our main donor um, and you can, keep, you can keep those stem cells and freeze them and pull them back out and expand them. So it's kind of indefinite uh, how much you can use them. Amazing. Thank you very much. And, and George, you can relax. Nobody's coming for your brain <laughs> yeah, cells. Yeah, I won't be pulling out any <laughs> brain cells. There, thank you very much. That was absolutely thank fantastic. You.